10 second security tip, go. Basically, don't trust anyone you don't know. For me, I won't answer calls coming from strange numbers. I won't open SMS messages coming from people I don't know. I won't open emails that I don't have the context or don't know the sender. Basically, it's good hygiene. Don't trust anyone you don't know. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. Joining me as always is my co-host, Mike Johnson. We are available at CISOseries.com and we're also available on the subreddit CISO series of which I am growing an audience, Mike, but not the activity I want yet. It's not LinkedIn level activity, which is what I would like. But we'll get there eventually, I hope. Wait, it, it takes a while. And and if you remember back, it took us a while to grow the audience on LinkedIn. Yes. So, you know, if we hang in there, it'll happen. Well, I hope. I hope it works like that. <laughs> I want to mention that our sponsor for today's episode is Reciprocity. They've been a great sponsor of the podcast. And in fact, I should mention the last CISO series video chat they sponsored, we talked about the speed of GRC and we introduced something on the video chat, which I think I'm going to bring to this podcast. And that is, I give an award out for the best bad idea. <laughs> and you wouldn't believe how many great bad ideas cybersecurity people come up with. There are a lot of really bad ideas in cybersecurity, so I'm actually not surprised. Well, but what what's cool about this, and the whole point of the bad idea is I force our guests to argue the, the benefits of the bad idea. And mm. when they do that, it actually creates a really kind of fun and entertaining discussion. So I may do the same to you. I may throw out a uh, community member's bad idea and see if you can argue its, its benefits. You think you're up for that? I'm up for it. That sounds like a lot of fun. All right. Awesome. Well, stay tuned for that. I now want to bring in our guest who wanted to come on to our show, and I'm thrilled that he wants to be here, and I'm thrilled to have him. He is the uh, currently the CSO for Elron Electronic Industries, which is actually a VC firm, and uh, he is the former head of the cyber department in the Israel Defense Force. It is Zohar Rosenberg. Zohar, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Great to be here. Why is everyone talking about this now? On this very podcast, we have sponsored guest episodes in which we dedicate a segment of the show for the sponsor to talk about their category. Now, I was just given the heads up by a listener that a competitor of one of our sponsored guests actually promoted that episode via an email marketing campaign. Now, I asked the community why they thought that happened. Did the company know they were promoting a direct competitor solution? Or were they of the philosophy of, let's just promote the space? You know, the more people who know about this problem, that benefits the entire industry. And in turn, that helps our competitor and us. Most people on LinkedIn agreed with the latter and actually thought it was a savvy marketing move, possibly demonstrating that the competitor was confident with their product. Mike, what do you think? This was interesting. And it's really cool, again, when you, we see these kinds of things where our episodes are showing up in marketing. That, that really says that, hey, we've got something going on here and people are interested listening and paying attention. So it was kind of a nice little attaboy to hear about this. In terms of the actual act of doing it, I mean, they certainly knew what they were doing. Marketers really have the savvy that, frankly, I don't have. But from my perspective, it seems like what they were doing was they were building awareness of the space. They were saying, hey, this is a problem. Others are talking about it. There's an entire podcast episode where this is being discussed. We have a product in this space. Let's talk. So I think it really is just getting out there, building that awareness. And I imagine that like the follow-up conversations are, okay, well, yeah, they're a competitor, but ours is better. Here's why you already understand the space because it's out there. And here's what we do. Here's how we solve the problem. Here's how we're better positioned than this competitor who is already featured. Well, I want you to know I have some more information on the story, but I want to go to uh, Zohar. What do you think about this tactic? And do you think you agree with Mike here? 
Yeah, so I, I often hear people saying, yeah, we'll let the other competitors educate the market and, and do the work for us and they'll do more marketing spending than we can save on marketing spending. I think there's a very fine line between market awareness and being the solution in aware. And in many times, if you get to do a real good market awareness, you are becoming the de facto solution in awareness. And it's very difficult to come afterwards because everyone says, ah, you're like them. So your your beginning position is sort of a me too, or I'm also there. And, and now you have to prove why you're better or why you're doing things really differently. So I'm less in favor of, of letting others educate the market. I think there is a very delicate line that most usually fail to see exactly where it is and they actually fall behind it. But let me let me follow up on that, Zohar, in that I don't know if they're letting others educate the market. I mean, any company is going to have competitors and these competitors, you know, given that the rise of content marketing has come up so much that their competitors are going to be talking about the space and educating the space. Is there value like, you know, is there value in being, uh, I'll take this one step further of, hey, you know, we could create a page on let's just say firewalls for that much and educating on firewalls. And we'll pull information from all over the internet and provide all these great links. And you know what? One of those links would be our direct competitor. Would that be a value to be seen as, oh, well, we're the kind of the hub to learn everything about firewalls. And yes, some of our links go to our competitor, which, you know, great, a great explanation of firewalls. Or should you avoid that like the plague? What do you think? I think if you're taking, you know, ownership of the of the space in 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 a sense, like you just described, then that is a smart move because you're saying, yeah, you, you, everyone needs to come to us to learn about it. Everyone needs to come to us to see everything else that's happening there. So you're owning the space. In that sense, I think there is good advantage in, in such a strategy. So I'm going to point something out, Mike, that I can't believe I didn't think to do it. And it took a listener to point out, again, the obvious. And that was... <laughs> why didn't you ask the competitor what their intention was? So I did what? that. And I actually just got an answer just before this recording. Turns out the reason that they promoted it, and it may be also for these other reasons too, but I did actually quote one of their employees on the show and they oh. were thrilled that I <laughs> quoted their employee and it was on some other segment. So they wanted to promote it for that reason because- I, well, I, I hadn't even thought of that. I didn't even think of that. Also, I didn't think the obvious thing of just ask them why they were doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more fun to just speculate wildly I know. And, and, and just put it out there. Exactly. But I will just say that even if they didn't, I think there's positive to all of this. And I, and I don't want to detract in any way from the sponsor either because they're the ones who want to lead the charge of the discussion by being on our show, which I, I am so grateful for. And that's why we love our sponsors so much. And I appreciate that. But I, I think, and, and just get your take on it, that whatever way it comes out, whether wittingly or unwittingly, I think it's all kind of benefiting the industry if everyone's sort of playing together. And then in, ultimately it's, the product that is best will win at the top. But it also the product that is best for some company's solution, which may not always be the same company or same product. I, I think we have to be a little bit careful of falling into the trap of any news is good news. Any press is good press. That's a good point. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful about that. Uh, but I do think that in the security field where there's so many niches, there's so many different corners the technology is generally so complicated and so difficult to understand that it does make sense for them there to be some additional willingness to let others, to Zohar's point, educate the market in order to kind of bring the whole thing along. So I think there's might be something specific to cybersecurity right now today, but at the same time, it's always best to, to own your own message. It's time for Ask a CISO. Tip of the hat to Sunil Yu, CISO at Residence at YL Ventures, for bringing up your comment, Mike, in a Slack channel of your frustration with cybersecurity startups who end up having an us-too attitude towards creating the next cybersecurity solution. What your complaint was that the only credentials was a successful exit, but not presenting a unique solution to an actual problem. Now, you claimed a criteria that you would only meet with a founder 
who had a committed idea to a product. But my question to you, Mike, is how do you differentiate between an also RAND and an actual unique solution? How do you do it? So real quick, I want to disclaim that this was a rant and rants tend to go far into an extreme. So I was pondering a criteria. I haven't implemented that. We appreciate your rants. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it came back to this whole idea of there's so many startups. There's so many new cybersecurity startups, like on a daily basis. I mean, maybe it's slowed down a little bit recently, but it was... You know, a new one a day is what it really felt like. And so many of them were not original ideas. It was, there's five vendors in the space. I'm going to be the sixth. And I'm just going to get there with a great sales channel. So that that was like the genesis of this. And kind of to your point and your, your question about the also ran is, it seems like so many of them are also rants. But what I really want to see and kind of how to differentiate that is sometimes it's like uniquely original. It's, I wasn't even aware of this problem, or I've had this problem and I have not been aware of solutions. And now there's somebody out there who's bringing this forward. So that, that's one way is it's just straight up, obviously original. But another thing to look for is when you see a passion, I, I talk about passion a lot, and it's, it's important to me that the founders are bringing a passion to what they're doing. It's not just going to be yet another exit and just you know, this, this serial turning the crank. Uh, th this is my industry. I, I want to see that passion. Uh, but I, I think the, the thing that really differentiates and calls, you know, calls to attention a unique solution is when someone is saying, I had this problem. I couldn't find anybody else who could solve it satisfactorily. So I'm starting a company to solve this problem that I myself have had in my career in my experience. And that's the differentiator. That seems to be the most classic valid reasons to start a company. And Zohar, that's why I'm throwing this to you now. I got to assume that is the most classic way. Is there another differentiator or is there something else that you see in a company that goes, oh, these guys got it or they're heading down the right path or this is a solution that needs to be dealt with. And then uh, vice versa, do you see people like go, guys, hey, you know you're getting to a uh, mire where you got a uh, hundred competitors. Sure. So I'll start with with the latter. I think that I do see a lot of founders coming with me too type of ideas, and a lot of times I think what they're not doing enough is enough research. And I'm I'm often surprised on how little research did they do on the other solutions out there in the market. It is difficult to do that research because there are so many solutions out there today, but that's not an excuse. And, and I see founders coming in with things that I, I'm saying, look, did you look at this, this, and this company? And they say, no. And I'm saying, okay, go look at it and then come back. So that's for those types. Well, but that's, like, by the way, that should be a red flag. I mean, if somebody comes and says, I got this product X and goes, and you say, you don't know your three biggest competitors, I'd be scared to do any business with them. I agree. <laughs> Go do your homework. But like, I wouldn't see them a second time. Like, like this is like the big mistake you made. I'm, I'm fearing for the future kind of a thing. Or do you give people a second chance? I, I'm willing to give people a second chance if, if I okay. recognize, as, as Mike said, you know, the passion. Okay. The other personal capabilities, people, when they're young founders, young entrepreneurs, they can make mistakes. Part of our sure. job as investors is to help them and, and help them learn and educate them. So I, I think that people can get a second chance. Those who come from their previous experience saying, yeah, that's a problem I had. I couldn't find any good solution. That is a very, very good start. My experience shows it's not necessarily enough because the fine tuning of a product market fit is, is really an art. And even if someone had a specific problem in his previous position, but he still viewed it from his hat at that specific position at that specific company, that is not a market validation because many other people may have some variances of this problem and they need the variance of the solution that that person suggested. So it, as I said, it, it's really a good start. The fact that you met a problem that you couldn't find any good solution to, but that in itself is not enough. 
you still need to make sure that there is a large base of potential customers that recognize the exact same problem and not a brother problem or a cousin problem, which happens a lot of times. And, and a lot of startups are, fall on that, that they think that they have the exact problem. And it turns out that most of the market feel a second relative to that problem. Who's our sponsor this week? It's Reciprocity. And here's Steve Prentice with more. The COVID-19 pandemic has substantially changed the way people work and connect. And although the focus is primarily on helping people get their work done through video and document sharing, the elephant in the room is an expanded attack surface, which has a direct impact on a company's governance, risk and compliance obligations. Scott McCormick, security specialist at Reciprocity Labs, explains how their product, Zen GRC, makes things easier to manage. Obviously, the pandemic that we're seeing, as everybody was forced to work from home, those are all key risks that are obviously realized through this pandemic time frame. A lot of the tech companies that here in the Bay Area and around you know, the country were already based in the cloud and were set up to move their workforce to work from home. But then legacy environments where people were still on desktops to, you know, protecting, you know, the fortress versus being able to give people laptops and know that the, the endpoints are protected. Those are all key risks that obviously are driving a lot of decisions these days. So governance, risk and compliance capabilities that Zen affords, you're able to obviously see those risks throughout its life cycle and over time. Moving to a cloud-based governance, risk and compliance solution helps organizations reduce reduce their time to audit by up to 50%, which includes everything from the controls and documentation on through to the actual audit itself. More information, case studies, and a demo are all available at zengrc.com. It's time to play What's Worse? All right, Zohar, you've heard the show. You know how this game is played, correct? Sure. All right. Well, I have a really, really good question, Mike, uh, or what's worse uh, scenario. And I, I must say, it's got a, a sort of an interesting twist to it that I had not heard on a previous what's worse, and I really like it. And it comes from Rafael Borges of Avid. He's in security at Avid, which is a powerful editing platform. And here are the two scenarios. And by the way, Zohar, you always answer second, and I always love it when people disagree with Mike. So I right, <laughs> set you up that way. Here you go. Scenario one, your IT team often uses security as a reason to say no to the business when they don't want to do something. Now, you as a security professional and your team, you never say no. I should point that out. But that's what your IT team does. All right. The other scenario is your IT team does everything the business asks without question and never involves the security team. Which one's worse? Oh, wow, Raphael. This is a tough one and an interesting twist, like, like, like you said, David. So you, you basically have the two extremes. Which is often the scenario on this show. Right, right. Where you've got, on the one hand, an IT team who basically keeps setting you up as the bad guy. Right. Uh, and I, I've seen IT teams, uh, I've talked with other CISOs, I've talked with other IT teams elsewhere where you have IT teams sometimes who just don't want to do things. A particular request comes in and it has nothing to do with security. And they're just saying, yep, security says no. So they're kind of using you as the bad guy for things they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's the one extreme. And the other extreme is like they just do everything and they're not pausing. They're not stopping to ask questions. They're just doing whatever the business is coming and asking for. And both of these are actually really bad. Back to our, our normal <laughs> setup here. Yes. So, so this is one that I, I'm sure everyone at home, uh, no matter what I say, is going to argue with me on this one. That's always good. The, the hallmark of a good question. And this is, again, me trying to buy time for yes, I know. Uh, saying a bad <laughs> the answer. Sure has a time limit, Mike. <laughs> I could go on for half an hour. I know you us, could. <laughs> pulling this one out. So I, I would say... The more dangerous for the business is what I focus on here. And if I've got an IT organization 
technical organization who's just doing everything and is not stopping to think, is not stopping to ask for advice, that's going to have the deeper impact on the company, on the organization. Me being set up as the bad guy for everything, that's more of a problem for me. Mm -hmm. Um, That's going to cause problems for my interactions with the rest of the company, but it's not going to have the same negative detriment to the company. That's where I go to on trying to decide which one is worse on this is which one is worse for the company. And the one that's worse for the company is the IT organization just saying yes to everything. And I would point out that the way you answered, if we were to say what's the worst for Mike Johnson in particular in the security team, you would say number one. Yes? Most likely, yes. Okay. Zohar, let me throw this one to you. Which one is worse of these two scenarios? Yeah, it is a tough question. After listening to Mike carefully, I have to say... I prefer an IT team that allows everything to happen because I've seen years of IT teams just really uh, stopping businesses, slowing down businesses, really disturbing things from happening. So I prefer them to let things flow and I'll deal with it later. Oh, so, okay. So good point. So you were actually arguing the same thing as Mike right there saying what's best for the business and you think it is actually better for the business number two versus what Mike said. So you kind of your same rationale, but you're picking the other one. Yes. Yes. Because I think what's best for the business is for the business to run ahead. Mike, any take on that? Cause he, he's, he's arguing the same as you. I, I think it's an interesting take. And, and that's part of what makes us such an interesting question. You can have the same exact rationale and come to the different conclusion. And I think it's, some of it is perspective and I, I can't, I can't disagree. I think the idea of letting the business run forward and then dealing with it later, that's a perfectly valid strategy. All right. Well, they are both the worst. Anyways, kudos to Raphael for a really, really good what's worse question. Thank you, Raphael. Close your eyes. Breathe in. It's time for a little security philosophy. On our CISO series video chat, Bob Henderson of Intelligence Services Group asked, has measuring risk itself become a risk? All right, we're getting a little meta here, I know, but follow (laughs) follow Bob's rationale here. Since risk is primarily arbitrary, depending on who defines a risk, wouldn't the solutions also be arbitrary and thus add complexity and uncertainty, which are then now contributors to the risk. Okay, have we gone down the rabbit hole enough there? All right, Zohar, I'm going to go to you first on this one. What do you think of Bob's take on this? And do you believe that sort of asking about risk itself, measuring risk itself is a risk in itself? No, in that sense, I disagree. I think dealing with it, talking about it, trying to measure it only helps the organization better understand where it stands what does it have? What doesn't it have? And I think that the ongoing business of trying to measure risk is important. All right. Let me throw this to you, Mike. What do you think? Do you think the whole act of measuring risk in itself and being that all the arbitrary decisions are being made after that, can that be a risk in itself? So to split hairs a little bit, there's multiple definitions of risk. There's big R risk, and that usually is made up of multiple other risks. And I think what Bob might be trying to communicate here is there's security risk and business risk. And I will absolutely agree that poorly measuring security risk can create a business risk, that you're looking at security in the wrong way, that you're perhaps assigning a risk too high of a score or too low of a score And then what you do with that can create business risk. But I should also mention, Bob's not saying anything that risk has been measured poorly. He's just saying that the act of it, that there can be good measurements, but it's still always, you know, to a degree, a mixture of subjective and objective. Agree or disagree there? If your risk program is so dependent on the subjective opinion of one person, you have a bad risk program. Okay. So yes, there's a subjective element to it, but it should be repeatable. It should Mm -hmm. be somebody else could look at it and come to the same conclusion. 
or maybe there's a group of people who are coming together on an opinion. Mm -hmm. So bad risk, bad risk measurement, however you're doing that, can absolutely create a business risk. Let's dig a little deeper. Zohar, this is a question directed specifically you, and that is, what are the intrinsic training elements of Israel's Elite 8200, which is their cybersecurity task force, of which it's not the only one, but it's the one that's so well known as being so elite and it's so hard to get into. But what what is about the training elements of that group that results in so many of the graduates going on to becoming cybersecurity entrepreneurs? What do you think is in the training itself that results in graduates becoming entrepreneurs? So actually, it, be, it begins be before the training. It begins with the screening process. How do we screen the people that we want to get into the training? We have learned by experience that the profile that we're looking for is more leaned towards personal abilities than experience and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the ability to learn, the ability to solve problems, the ability to work as part of a team, for example, these are very important skills that are that have greater importance than specific knowledge or experience. If we get the right people in, we'll be able to train them. If we get the wrong people in, we won't be able to train them the same way. So it starts with screening. And, and hold it, can I pause? I want to pause you because I'm very interested. Because I think a lot of hiring managers would like to know the answer to this. What are things that you do during the screening process to determine those elements you just mentioned? Wow. Uh, so it's a quite, quite a long process. But some of the things we do are, for example, uh, sort of group workshops. You know, we, we take four or five people, put them in a group, get them to solve a problem. And we observe how they perform individually and as a team. Another thing is that we give them problems from different problem domains. It can be electrics, biology, computer science, different problem domains. And we see how they access the problem. How do they understand the problem? How do they try to start and find a solution to the problem? So that's, you, you get to see how they think, how they, how they approach a problem. All right. So uh, th that's a training. So go, go on in terms of, it starts at the sort of the hiring process. And then once they're in, is there some specific training that goes on that you, you see them that you're either grooming them? I mean, obviously they're grooming them to be good at their job in the military, but what happens in that process that they they go on to becoming such great entrepreneurs, you, you believe? Becoming great entrepreneurs, I think it's, it's a lot more than just the training process. It's the whole service. The training process, again, helps you cultivate capabilities like working under a lot of stress because the, the basic training is sort of a boot camp, three months, close uh, quarters, 16, 18 hours a day, really very, very intensive. And you're 18, yeah? so mm -hmm. it's it's really intensive for for those guys or or women. That's for just an example of developing the the personal skills. But the overall service, so there is a lot of emphasis on personal responsibility, encourage creativity, encourage taking risk, in, encourage self opinion. And so in in 8200, you would see a very young soldier being encouraged to express his or her's opinion in front of the commander of the unit, which is like infinite ranks above. Mm -hmm. That is very uncommon, not only in other uh, units or militaries, not even in a lot of civilian companies that, you know, mm -hmm. the, the CEO would listen to the uh, junior developer. That, that, that seldom happens, but that is the culture. Right. And I've heard this a lot. And what what is actually I'm very intrigued is what is intrinsically done in the culture to foster that you know eagerness to hear from the lowest ranks up to the highest ranks. So anything from you know it's not very uh, discipline oriented unit. You bring the juniors to the uh, meeting rooms of the seniors. You educate them that. It is not only allowed, it is the desired state that if they have something to say, if they want to be heard, if they think that those above them have made the wrong decisions, 
they should shout about it. So that's going back to the basic training. That's part of the messages that uh, that are being delivered to them from day one. So 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 it's ingrained in them. And and anything in addition, like you know, what what would you educate? Like as you're bringing in, you know, as you're talking to startups within your organization. What I'm going to guess most of them are, are probably Israeli that you're talking to. So they already know this. They already understand this. Is there anything that you would educate others to like that you don't see in other startups outside of the is- Israel? They're like, hey, you need to sort of foster this kind of behavior if you want to have the same level of competition that we have learned to you know live with. Yeah, so I think the personal responsibility angle is really, really important. If, if each and every one feels that it's on his shoulders for the organization to be successful, then you start thinking differently and you start acting differently and and you're more committed and you're more engaged. And at the end of the day, it brings everything and everyone to a higher level of success. So I think personal responsibility is a very, very critical. uh... All right, let me throw this to you, Mike, to close it out. Uh, I know that you did not serve in the 8200. You are not Israeli. You did not have the <laughs> demanded service, but you do talk to a lot of entrepreneurs in this space. And what have you seen? I What I really appreciate was, frankly, listening to Zohar there because I've I've wondered. I, I've wondered where some of these attributes have come from, like the, the willingness to take a risk and, and start a company, the willingness to have a conversation with anybody and challenge opinions, the willingness to concentrate more on the ability to learn rather than necessarily the experience that they that they've had I, th- I think a lot of the the entrepreneurs one of the things that they're trying to figure out is how do I build a team when you've been through that experience and you understand what it took to build a team that you were a part of a successful team that you were a part of you then have a background of qualities for you to go look for you recognize that it's less on what have you done? What is your personal experience? And more on your ability, more on what I can teach you, what you can grow into. And 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 that's been very interesting to me when I've spoken with not only entrepreneurs who've come up through 8200, but just entrepreneurs in general. I think it's it's almost a common quality of the successful entrepreneurs, regardless of where you're coming from, But I think folks that are coming up through 8200 have that additional advantage of having been through years of it and having seen what a larger machine looks like. Well, that is a good place to stop this episode of the podcast. Uh, I have to thank Zohar so much for uh, joining us today. I greatly appreciate your insight, especially at the very last segment here, as, as Mike just said. The, I must say that the, my, the number one thing that I am so sort of appreciative and recognize is this willingness for the lower ranks or the eagerness to have the lower ranks speak to the higher ranks, which is something we don't really have that much of, I know, or I hear of in this uh, in our military in the U.S. And I would like someone who has served in our military to tell me that I'm completely wrong on that or as things have changed. So eager to hear how things have changed or why that might not be a good idea the u.s military please let me know i also want to thank our sponsor reciprocity for sponsoring this episode of the podcast check them out they are at reciprocitylabs.com and also uh, I, I believe zengrc.com both will take you to the same place zohar we let you have the last word uh, but mike you first zohar thanks for joining us i i want to echo what david just said about that unique perspective of being able to have anyone in the organization talk to the leader uh, and not only the ability to do that, but it's encouraged. And just that that nugget was great for me to hear. I'm, I'm sure our audience will appreciate it. So, so thank you specifically for that nugget and kind of doubling down on what, what David said. I also appreciated some of the earlier comments that you had about what you're looking for in founders, the feedback that you're giving them, the point about like the art of the product market fit. So a lot of great nuggets in this episode. So so thank you for joining us, bringing your experience, sharing it with our audience. All right. And Zohar, any last comments? Are you guys hiring or I bet you all your portfolio companies are hiring? Yeah, definitely. Uh, at least part of our portfolio is still hiring in, the, in these days. There are good opportunities now since 
other companies are also uh, letting people off. So some have it rougher, some have it uh, better in, in, during these uh, strange times. I want to thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. It was a great pleasure. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Zohar. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, our sponsor, Reciprocity. And thank you, audience, for coming up with great what's worst scenarios and great questions for the for the show. As I always say, the show survives on your input. So we greatly, greatly appreciate that. Speaking of lower to higher ranks, we're neither. <laughs> <laughs> but we love to hear from our audience thank you everybody for participating and listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast that wraps up another episode if you haven't subscribed to the podcast please do if you're already a subscriber write a review this show thrives on your input head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate including recording a question or comment for the show if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.